Jesus is alive. We know the story. We're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday next week, so I hope you're looking forward to that celebration. I hope that you're, you're, you're preparing your heart and mind for that. Let me, let me uh, just recap what's going to be happening in the coming week. We got some noise heading out this way. That's okay. Church is supposed to be noisy. Amen? At least good church is. Good church is supposed to be noisy. It's like herding cats. I know. That's, one of them is mine. Love it. <laughs> love it, love it. Adults, leaders, thank you so much. We'll see you in a little bit. Love you guys. Um, special thank you before we go any step further. Roger and Joella Alexander um, are two of the busiest people on this campus. They work super hard in many different areas of ministry. Uh, they saw a gap on Sunday nights, and they said, we'll jump in and fill the gap. And they've been doing that, and, and our kids choir, kids praise time, um, and they asked me to encourage. Um, you know, we still have stuff happening on this campus on Sunday nights. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have an adult gathering time, a worship gathering here that meets in the main room. Uh, kids praise, uh, they meet at the same time. Student ministry has activities going on all evening long. Uh, we have ministry opportunities, um, discipleship opportunities on Sunday evenings here on the Crossroads campus. Now, tonight, um, big time, I don't even know if I'm going to be in this room tonight because they're having an ice cream party over there, okay? <laughs> ice cream's been a little bit of a theme these past couple weeks here at Crossroads. Um, so here's the thing, even if your kids did not participate this morning, Tonight would be a great opportunity for them to jump into Kids Praise um, so they can participate in this. This is not about learning songs. This is about learning theology. This is about learning and knowing about God and growing in their faith. And then they come and share and encourage us out of the overflow of those things. I'll tell you, I love that our kids are doing that. I want your kids doing that. Um, and we are blessed overwhelmingly so. Um, so if here's the thing. Ice cream party tonight. Come out. Have your kids enjoy that. Um, it's going to be a great time tonight um, for them, and uh, we'll be meeting in here as normal. Our, our schedule, we've been out and away doing other things these past few weeks, but we're back uh, in the big room tonight, and I'm excited about worshiping the Lord together this evening. All right, if you have your Bibles, Roger, did I, did I get it all? Okay, and Roger's buying ice cream, so you don't even have to bring money. Just bring like a spoon or something. That'll be great. Hey, John chapter 12, go ahead and open, open your Bibles to John chapter 12. Today is Palm Sunday. I love Palm Sunday. You can cheer for Palm Sunday, that's okay. Today is the day where we're, we're kind of the, the, the culminating part of, of Jesus' ministry kind of begins, where we begin that, that climactic uh, approach to ministry for him. Um, you know, Jesus has been, has been moving and operating um, uh, for, for three, three and a half years or so um, in, in, in Judea, uh, Samaria as well, and, and, and has had a huge impact. He has grown great crowds, and he's scattered them. He's healed, he's restored, he's forgiven, he's resurrected. His, his earthly ministry has, has been, has been life-changing, world-changing. We're still talking about Jesus today. That's incredible to me. What other individual 2,000 years ago do we know so much about who has had this kind of impact on the world? And for everybody, it's not always a positive impact, right? I mean, there are people who don't like Jesus who still don't know what to do with him. Well, here's the thing. You can't do anything but either receive Christ and accept him or you can reject him and turn him away. That's, that's, that's always been, the, the two. there's no middle ground, that's always been where Jesus, by the way, that's where Jesus squared up uh, our relationship with him. He, he put it this way, if you're not with me, you're against me. He didn't leave any room for, for, for wiggling or slithering, those are two things that I love to do, I love to wiggle and slither. He doesn't leave room for that when it comes to him. He doesn't leave any room for that, and he never did. So as we celebrate today, I would just want to kind of build a little bit of a context here so that we can look at Palm Sunday and let it be for us, as much as it can be, what it was for those people who were in Jerusalem uh, there that day. Now, it's, it's Passover time in, in Jerusalem, and th this was always a high watermark 
uh, the feasts and festivals that where they gathered in Jerusalem were always were always a big time in terms of, of of the city of Jerusalem, and this was no different. Scholars suggest that probably two and a half million people would descend on the city of Jerusalem during this time. That's you know we're all, we're over doubling the typical population you would see in and around that that city. So we have we have. Uh, we have an environment that is already buzzing, people already milling about. God has set it all up where we have this amazing throng of people that have gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And this is the time where Jesus makes his boldest declarations, where he says some of his hardest things, where he does some of his most incredible ministry. This is a season this week is where he would go into the temple and flip tables over. By the way, that's been my prayer. That when we enter this week of, and this has been my prayer for years and years in ministry, that that Passion Week would be a time where Jesus would come and flip the tables over in my life. I'm reminded this week that religion just doesn't cut it. And it never has. And I want God to come and, and drive all the unnecessary and the pointless and the worthless out of my life and restore the power and the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life. This week would be, would be culminating. This is the week where Jesus would make all the right people mad. This is the week where Jesus kind of proved he was not a gentleman. He was not always nice. He did what was necessary. He said what was necessary. In fact, the things he did this week would be the thing that would break, would break the straw on the camel's back, where they just said, the religious, religious leader said, enough. We need, to, we need to plot. We need to scheme. We need to, we need to figure out how we can remove this individual from ruining what we have spent so long to set up. That's what Jesus does. That's exactly what Jesus does. That's what Jesus did then. He's still doing it today. So on this day, with all these people gathered in the city, and Jesus is now a household name. He's known throughout the region. So he's not this unknown guy who just shows up in Jerusalem. He's known. He's a known quantity. He's made some folks incredibly happy. He's transformed countless lives, and he's made a bunch of folks mad. And Palm Sunday is a day where he kind of continues that pattern and that practice. Today, my hope is, and my hope for you and for me, for all of us, is that Jesus would ride in, not asking permission. I shared this with some of the guys as we were praying this morning, Um, and I'll share this a little bit later just in, in in our brief time this morning, is that, you know, Jesus did not go to Herod or to Pilate or to the city council, or to the leaders. He never went to them and said, hey, can I have permission to ride into to Jerusalem as, as king of kings and lord of lords? Can I pl- would that be okay if I did that? Would it, can I pull a permit to create this scene at the city gate? Can I do that? Would that be okay? You know why Jesus doesn't ask permission? Because God doesn't ask permission for anything. He just does it. So as Jesus rides in on the back of that donkey, on the back of that foal, he, he makes a bold declaration. And, and really, the story certainly is about him. It revolves around him and what he does, what he says. This may be one of the boldest messages he ever proclaims, and he doesn't really utter a word. It's the event and what he does that speaks loudest. But today, I want to kind of I wanna hear the message, but I want to talk about the people who were gathered there, who watched and witnessed and took part in in what happened that day. And I want us to realize and recognize that every person gathered here in this this house of worship, every person everywhere in the world will fall into one of these four categories that we're going to be looking at this morning. So I want to pray for us because we're going to be talking about people who are casual observers to Jesus. We're going to be talking about people who are, who, are, who are callous critics. We're going to be talking about people who are convicted sinners and those who are committed followers. Those are, you can fill in almost every blank on your listener guide this morning just by, just by getting those things. 
Every single person in this room falls into one of those four categories. My prayer is that he would move you as he rides into your life declaring himself as king. Not asking your permission, not begging that you would receive him as king or that you would affirm his royalty, but that you would simply acknowledge who he is and realize and recognize who you and I are in our relationship with him. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for the most amazing gift that was ever given. Gift of Jesus. Born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, sinless, and yet was accused, was accosted, was discredited, was disavowed, and ultimately would be betrayed by one of his nearest and dearest. There would be a mock trial, God, there would all those things would happen and all of that would lead to, to punishment and torture and execution, God, in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. But God, it's moments like these where we stop and we celebrate all of what Jesus did because apart from Him, paying the ransom, taking our punishment upon himself. None of us, none of us, God, would be, would be forgiven or set free. So God, today, would you speak to our hearts? Would you remind us today, God, that there is only one fitting response to Christ. And God, it begins with the word that the crowds shouted that morning. Hosanna. Save now. Holy Spirit, open our ears and our hearts, God, to receive these truths this morning. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning? John chapter 12. John chapter 12, beginning, beginning in verse 12. We're going to be reading all the way through verse 19. The passage reads, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet Him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is He who comes, in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You may be seated. So two and a half million folks. Gathered in this city, according to the text, they, they heard that Jesus was coming. They had heard about this, this miracle that had taken place just a few miles down the road. You remember the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, a friend of, of Jesus. Jesus was a friend of the, of the family. Je Lazarus went, went, came ill and, and ultimately died. And, and Jesus let all of that happen um, so that when he ultimately arrived on the scene, Lazarus had been dead uh, three, four days. So there would be no doubt, no question as to the condition of Lazarus, of course. And what did Jesus do? He told the sisters, he is not dead, he's been sleeping. And they want to tell him in the most respectful way, um, no, he's dead. Whatever you were going to do, that has been passed. We're, we're beyond. We know you can heal, and we've heard other stories, but it's not just that he just passed away. It's, you know, in fact, if you have the King James, you read the story, it's, 
well, they asked him to roll the stone away, and they said, well, it's going to smell. King James, it says, it stinketh is the word that appears there. It's incredible, right? So, so Jesus then tells, commands the people, doesn't ask, just says, roll the stone away. And then standing far off from the tomb, he cries out to Lazarus, come forth, come out. And Lazarus, life having been restored to his body, obeys the call of the Savior and comes out alive. If you're a Christian this morning, that story should resonate with you. Because that means there was a point in your life where Jesus called your name. And he quickened you, he regenerated you, gave you life so that you could obey his call to come out of the grave that you were in. Oh, pastor, I wasn't, I wasn't dead. Yes, you were. You were dead in ways you cannot even begin to imagine. You were so dead you didn't even know it. Life has a way of blinding us to those spiritual realities, doesn't it? Spiritually dead, Christ comes out, come out of the grave, calling each and every person by name. I love the work of Christ that does that. So that sets the scene. Jesus then arrives in Jerusalem. I'm thinking with two and a half million people gathered in a city and Jesus just a matter of days before raising Lazarus from the dead, word's going to spread. It's all over Facebook. It's Twitter. It's been in the paper. It's all over the place. Word is spreading. You know what? None of that stuff existed. How did it spread? When something, when God does something amazing, word spreads. And I want to talk about this crowd that gathered. Because Jesus is who he is. Jesus is not the king because as he rode in on that donkey, people said, oh, by the way, you're king. He's not king because you said he was. He's king because he is. Whether I acknowledge that truth or not, Jesus is who he is. What he wants to do in, in you and I is awaken us to those realities, to the truth of who he is. And by the way, you and I, in our own strength and our own ability and our humanity, we cannot look at Christ and go, that's the Savior. It is only by a work of God that that even happens. If you remember the story, Jesus is there with his disciples and he says, who do men say that I am? Who do others say that I am? And it was a long list of possibility, potential that, that, that was offered. And finally, Jesus just says, all right, enough. Who do you say that I am? You're mine. You're my guys, you're my home team. Who do you say that I am? And the reply was, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it was Peter who spoke those words, and it was Jesus who quickly affirms Peter in what he says. Remember the words of Christ? He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, or Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. If you are a Christ follower this morning, you did not arrive at that because you are wise. You, you weren't, in fact, you didn't arrive at that at all. It was delivered to you. It was the Father who revealed that to you and gave you an ability to believe and to have faith in who Jesus is. And that belief transforms life. So this crowd of probably thousands, as they gathered there at that gate. Were they all Christ followers? Nah, couldn't be. I mean, just a matter of days later, some of those same people who were crying out Hosanna and waving palm branches and laying their cloaks down on the ground would be shouting something very different. Crucify him. How does somebody go from Hosanna to crucify him? Sin. Convenience, pride, there's a list of things we would, I think, very easily just journey through to identify the reason why we would do that. Peter went through that same journey the night that Jesus was betrayed. Peter's declaring his boldness, I will go with you wherever they take you. I'll lay my life down with you if that's what's necessary. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me. You know what happened? The guy who said, I'll go with you to the end, denied even knowing Christ. 
sitting next to a fire but hours later. So who are we? We need to get real. We need to get honest. We need to get serious. Because the question of Jesus for you and I, on that hinges eternal life. So, so this passage gives us, gives us just, just some incredible questions we have to ask and answer. So I want to give you just a quick intro here, just, just a couple thoughts that will hopefully give us a good platform by which we can talk about the, the crowd and really hopefully talk about us. So when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, he did so proclaiming with clarity that he was God's promised Messiah. You know, it's not that Jesus on a whim said, you know what, fetch me a, a young donkey, I want to I do that today. There was a reason why he did it. In fact, John's passage tells us why. John's passage declares that there was a prophecy here that had to be fulfilled. And there was a message even couched within the prophecy that needed to be proclaimed. What was the message? The message was that Jesus was king. Kings usually came in one of two ways into cities like this. They could ride on a horse, which was significant because in riding on a horse, the king or the one who came was coming as a conqueror. The horse was not a symbol of peace. It was a symbol of, of conflict and war. And when a king rode in on a horse, not a word needed to be said. He's coming as a conqueror. You don't have a choice. When the Romans rode in, they rode in on horses. That's how they went. Now, the difference, a donkey is something very different. It's no less a powerful declaration. Don't get caught up. I need my horse folks to check in with me. Don't think horse is strong, donkey's weak. No. The proclamation of king is just as powerful. Jesus came in riding on a donkey, declaring himself to be king, but that he wasn't coming as a conqueror per se. Just stop. That day will come. The day of donkeys is over. Jesus will come back riding on a horse, sword drawn, ready for battle, okay? But on this day, he rode in on a donkey, declaring himself to be king, but one that was bringing with him peace. It is a fulfillment of that passage that we read that comes out of Zechariah chapter 9. It is also a fulfillment of what we hear the angels say in Luke chapter 2, which is what? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Here is where Jesus is saying, yes, I'm coming to bring peace, not as, not as a conquering king, but as one who is coming to conquer and to bring peace. We need to be reminded this morning one more time, and I need, we need to say this again and again. We need to repeat this often. Jesus did not come to bring world peace, folks. The liberal Christians have it wrong. Jesus did not come bring, to bring the United Nations world peace. He came to bring peace between his people and himself. The hostility that sin brings between us and God that maybe for some of you is imperceptible. You don't even sense it. You say, I'm not angry or hostile with God. Let me just make this declaration. It doesn't matter what you say. If God says there's hostility, enmity is the word the book of Romans used. If there's enmity between us, then trust me when I tell you that is true. We base our truth on truth not on opinions or feelings, on the truth of the word. We govern our lives by the truth of the word, not on our feelings, not on our desires or our whims. Jeremiah tells us in, in chapter 17 that our hearts are deceitful and wicked. They're not worth following. Jiminy Cricket, Christianity doesn't work. What was Jiminy Cricket? Do you remember Jiminy Cricket from, from Pinocchio? What, did he, what was his encouragement to Pinocchio? Just. What? Follow your heart. It's the worst advice anybody could give anybody when it comes to spiritual matters. Because your heart will lead us, our heart will lead us away from God, away from Christ, away from truth. Please don't trust your heart. It's because these people, I think, were governed by their hearts that they're Hosanna one day and crucify him three or four days later. We need to realize and recognize that Jesus rode in on as a king. 
Again, he didn't ask permission. He wasn't looking for anybody's approval. He was declaring himself to be the rightful heir of the throne of David. And he was. And it was only going to be the Messiah who could be that. This event, I believe, compels people both then, there, that day, and that moment, and people now, today. Compels us to answer the question, is Jesus king? And I think we need to go even a step further than that. For each and every one of us, for me this morning, we have to ask the question, is he my Four kinds of people there that, that morning. The first one, we've already kind of mentioned them. So let's just kind of dial through them quickly. Let's talk first about the casual observer. The casual observer. This is the laid back guy. This is the person who, who may not be fully aware of what's going on, but is at least willing to check into what's happening, what's going on. The casual observer is someone who kind of stands back at a distance, really doesn't get caught up in the in either the excitement or being close proximity to Jesus. In fact, guys like Jesus to the casual observer kind of push us away a little bit. Jesus makes the casual observer uncomfortable. Does Jesus still do that today? Does he make people uncomfortable? Yes, both outside the church and I would argue inside. When you, when you start talking about what it means to be a Christ follower, People get uncomfortable. There was a book written a few years back, and there's, there's been a few along the same vein, but one that Craig Rochelle wrote, pastor of uh, Life Church out in Oklahoma City. The book is entitled Christian Atheist. You maybe have heard me talk about this before. What is a Christian atheist? A Christian atheist is one who wants just enough Jesus to go to heaven, but not too much Jesus that my life has to change. Does that describe you this morning? One who wants just enough Jesus to to, to cross the line, but not enough to make any real radical transformations in your life. Because frankly, we like the way things are now. We want fire insurance. Have you heard that expression before? We don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven. And we're, we'll, we'll do some things to hopefully ensure that I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. So what's the least I have to do to do that? Can I just... I love you, and I want you to hear me say this. If you're asking those questions, or if you've framed your relationship with God that way, today you need to get right with Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't want part or some. He's either Lord or he's not. He's either king or he's not. And you can't go down halfway. You go all the way, or you don't go at all. The casual observer is one who who may not participate. Maybe that casual observer isn't waving palm branches because that's just not dignified. The casual observer says, you know what, I'll do, I, there's a parade happening here, but this is not going to affect my schedule. We want to hear the stories. Maybe we want to see the guy who is reportedly the guy who raised someone from the dead in Bethany just a few miles off, but really not someone that, well, you know, I'll watch, I'll spectate, but I'm not going to participate. You uncomfortable? Because if you are, because here's the thing, we're not talking about the people then. Are we not talking about the people now too? This is where, and I, trust me when I tell you, I've been through all four of these, and man, some of this stings a little bit. But again, it's how we receive Christ that determines our eternity. Can you be a casual observer to Jesus? No, you can't. Not, not be right with God. Casual observers just keep their distance. They, they watch, they observe, but again, the gospel, Jesus, there's no, there's no influence, there's no impact, there's no change in that person's life. There's a passage in Revelation chapter 3 where Jesus is speaking to the, the seven churches in in Asia Minor, and here in Revelation chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, there is a description of a casual observer that Jesus speaks to. Listen to this. Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, because you are a casual observer, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
You cannot be a casual observer to Jesus. It's all in. It's all in. We can't just watch and spectate and go, man, I saw Jesus do something incredible. I watched Jesus riding on that donkey. I watched. You can either be a witness to something or you can be evidence to something. To say I watched something happen and or to be that person where you are the something that happened. You're the something that God did in, where he transformed and changed. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, no permission, just rides in. And there are those who just watched. When Jesus rides into my life and your life, are we just spectators? No, we, we can't just be casual observers. We need to be, we need to be more than that. There's nothing casual about being a Christ follower. So the casual observer, then we need to, we need to talk about the calloused critic. We know, we know a, lot about, a lot about these folks. There were, in fact, the Gospels kind of record a bit of a journey about the calloused critic. What's the difference between the casual observer and the calloused critic? Well, the big thing is the casual observer is like jello. They don't care. They just kind of go with the flow, right? The calloused critic is one who stands openly hostile and against the movement. And it's not just openly hostile, but also maybe takes it the next step where now they're trying to convince others that all of this happening over here is wrong and we need to battle for and protect what is good and right, at least in our eyes. Did Jesus have those people revolving and orbiting his reality? Oh my goodness gracious, yes. I mean, we were, probably the first group of people that came to your mind were the, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees weren't just content to go, ah, eh, he's just some guy from, from Nazareth. What good comes out of Nazareth? We don't have to worry about him. No, these, this was a group of people from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. They were there engaging, testing him, questioning him, trying to get him to slip up or crack up so that he would lose credibility with the crowds. And you want to know something? The harder they worked the more influence Jesus had. Jesus, by the way, said some tough things to these folks. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. By the way, this happened in public, in front of everybody. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You hypocrites. Wow. He called those people, he called them a brood of vipers. That's a nice Bible way of saying you bunch of snakes now some of you don't know that jesus how did jesus call people names church family he's the only one who's allowed to because the name we receive is the name that's accurate it's the name that's right I mean, ultimately, we know God is sovereign, but did the calloused critics, did these people have a plot and a scheme? Yes. In fact, the events that would largely happen this week, Jesus would yield himself to, and it would be those calloused critics who wanted to defend and protect their standing in the community. They would be the ones who would be the driving force behind the plot to betray, arrest, and ultimately crucify Jesus. It's one thing to be a casual observer, something else to be a callous critic. I shared earlier, Jesus said, you are either with me or you are against me. Is there any room to move there? Jesus says you're in one of those two groups, right? So here's the thing, the, the callous critic, middle ground for them? No. No, the callous critics, they, they have a problem. They're not passive or they're not passive against Christ. They are fully engaged in hostility. And yet, even through all of what Jesus had to endure, did Jesus win victories, even people coming out of that group? <laughs> Who took Jesus down from the cross and buried him? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, both who sat on the council of the Sanhedrin. Can Jesus win the heart of a calloused critic. Yes. 
Do we write those people off? Those who are opposed to Christ, who are against Christ? No. How do you win someone you just called a snake to yourself? How do you do that? I don't know. Jesus did it. I've never been able to do that. Hey, you're a snake. All right, how do I love you and follow you? Because I don't, but here's, isn't that what Jesus does though? He calls us out, calls us what we are, which leads to really biblical sorrow, godly sorrow, which leads to repentance and relationship with Christ. If you're waiting for Jesus to politely ask you, please follow me, he's not going to do that. Jesus is not a beggar looking for followers. He is a king who comes to the city, who comes to, to you and to me and says, I am king, follow me. That's it. Does he answer questions? You bet he does. Nicodemus, John chapter 3. Some of those famous quotes in the Bible come out of a conversation that Jesus has with, with this man, Nicodemus, who was really one of the chief teachers in all of Judaism in that day. And Jesus has a very hard conversation because it's in this conversation that he schools the teacher. And pretty much calls him out and says, why do I have to explain this to you? You should know this. It's out of that conversation that we we hear Jesus say, you must be born again. That is not some crazy, conservative, evangelical byline. Those are the words of Christ. There is no other kind of Christian than one who is born again. It's out of that same conversation that Jesus says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life and it was in that conversation i believe nicodemus began a journey a journey away from being a calloused critic to one who was ultimately going to be a convicted sinner and then ultimately a christ follower a committed follower of jesus so we've had the casual observer the callous critic i would argue those two people there that day one of them just kind of just kind of watching, just kind of seeing how things go, not wanting to engage, but still willing to watch. And then you've got the guy in the crowd who's watching Jesus come through, watching the people go spaz as the king of the Jews comes in, and just being uncomfortable, at, and just grumbling, arms folded, scowls on their face like they've been baptized in vinegar, just kind of standing there, just shaking their heads. But in this journey, we go from this observer to the critic, and then we get to this third category, this third person. This individual is the, it's the convicted sinner. Whenever someone came into the presence of Christ, something incredible happened. I love the story of, in Luke chapter 5, where Jesus is calling his disciples together. And in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is doing some teaching there on the beach. And Peter and his brother and James and John, probably some others, they just come in from a hugely successful night of fishing. No? Zero. Goose egg. That's why they call it fishing and not catching, right? It's fishing. Sometimes you go out and you don't get anything, right? So they come back, and Jesus is teaching, and Jesus, in the middle of teaching, looks over and says, hey, guys, why don't you let your nets down? And Peter, <laughs> amazing guy that he is, right? He just hadn't been awakened yet to the realities of who Jesus is. He responds, again, in public, we've been fishing all night. We've caught nothing. Nothing. It's a nice way of saying, hey, carpenter, I'm the fisherman. You do your thing. I'll do mine. Right? But he doesn't end there. He says, but if, if you tell us, if you tell us to let our nets down, we'll, we'll do it. So what do they do? They, they drop their nets. You know the story? Some of you do. Maybe some of you don't. The nets go into the water, and because of the amount of fish that they caught, two things happen. One, their nets begin to break. Nets they'd used all night that had caught nothing were now swelling with fish. And as they tried to pull 
this catch. Because by the way, in their minds, I've been out there all night, caught nothing. Jesus on the beach tells me to lower my nets, and I do. I'm pulling this in. This makes up for a bad night, right? And as they pull their catch in, the, the text reads that the boats begin to sink because, well, they're overwhelmed. And you get to verse 8. Listen to what Peter says. I love this because I think this is kind of a universal response. In verse 8 it says, But when Simon Peter saw these things, he fell down at Jesus' knees. So he's down. He's on his knees in front of Christ. And he says what? Listen to this. Are you listening? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Can we just run through quick what Peter didn't say? Wow, do it again. Or, man, that was cool. You see, when we come into the presence of Jesus, in his fullness and in his power, which many of us in the room claim that we have, our response is to drop to our knees because we are no longer capable of standing. And we become immediately aware of our sinfulness. How do you go from, I have never known one fisherman to get so excited about the catch of the day that they respond with, no, I'm such a sinner. It doesn't happen. We just have a good day fishing, right? But a good day fishing when Jesus is the one present, directing, commanding, we become aware of our sin. And we recognize in those first two words that Peter said. What's his first two words? Oh, three. Sorry. Depart from me. We cannot stand to be in the presence of the holiness of God. Is that an isolated incident in Scripture? No, a lot of you know the story from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has a vision of being in the throne room of God. And you know what he said? Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, sin, there it is, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, I sin and I hang out with a bunch of like kind. I'm undone. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Every time someone comes into the presence of God, I love you, Jesus, but is not the response. I know this isn't right, but is not the response. We become aware of our sin and we just want to get away. And does Jesus say, all right, I'll go. No, Peter had to learn how to endure in his sinfulness, how to be in the presence of Christ. He had to grow in his understanding of what it meant to be forgiven and set free. And I believe he didn't really get all of that until Jesus had died, rose again, and ascended, and he ultimately received the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost. Someone who is a convicted sinner, I believe, still believe this today, that even those two incidents, and there are others in Scripture that we could look to, I don't believe these responses should be the rare occasion. I don't believe they should be the oddity. I believe that even for Christians, when you and I come in the presence of the Savior, when we come in the presence of God in our, in our QTs, our quiet times, our Devo times, when we do that, we become immediately aware of our sinfulness. In fact, we need to clear the decks, clear the slates. We need to restore that fellowship so that we can enjoy the presence of the Savior. Let me ask you a question, Christians. Have you ever tried to muscle through a quiet time and you know, you haven't, you've got junk in your life, you know it, you won't deal with it? I don't know what happens to you, but here's the thing. God will not let me read this. Like I'll sit there and try to read passages out of the text and he won't let me do it. Oh, I might scan the words and read them, but I'm, they're not settling in. They're not penetrating. They're not digging in deep. And there have been those occasions where I just got to go, all right, Quiet time is going to shift. We're going to, we're, going to, we're going to call an audible and we're going to deal with what needs to be dealt with. 
because I can't come into the presence of the Savior, into the presence of Christ. It's dirty. Jesus cleans us, but is that just a one-time thing? My goodness, 1 John 1, 9. If any of us sins, what? We confess. We bring those things before God, and then he says he's, he's righteous. His righteousness. He cleanses us. He forgives us. He restores us. Folks, I don't know where you are this morning, but I need, about, I need that in my life about every 10 minutes or so. That's my average right now, about every 10 minutes. Maybe you're going 20 or 30. Maybe you go half a day. Praise God for that, right? But he, here's the thing. If my sin brings separation between me and God, here's the thing. I have experienced what it is to have intimacy with Christ. My spirit, my life, I can no longer tolerate separation. I can no longer be comfortable just being a convicted sinner. It's not enough to be convicted. Conviction has to lead to something else, doesn't it? God convicts us for a purpose. Say, oh, pastor, come on. Does God really make us feel guilty? With a hammer, yes, for a purpose. He's not doing to get you. He's doing that because he loves you, wants relationship with you, and I am just enough of a knucklehead to realize that there are going to be those seasons, those times where sin is just attractive enough to where I can just check in for a minute, right? And God says, you're my boy, and I love you, and oh no, you don't. And with his love, with his conviction, he brings us back and shows us, identifies. And by the way, the light of the gospel. Wow, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He also said we would be light of the world, right? Um, hey, guys, in, in the back, Paul, Pastor Paul, can you help me with something? I just, illustration, cool, real quick. Can you take that spotlight? Don't burn me with it, okay? But can you like shine, like tighten up the spotlight and and... Everybody look up at the spotlight. Just everybody look up at this thing right here. We, oh, okay, turn the lights off. We have this incredible spotlight. It's an amazing tool we have, okay? We have this spotlight. It's on, okay? Here it is. It's on. But you can't look at this and necessarily perceive that it's on. Let's make this look like the light of the gospel. Paul, would you tighten this up? Make it like a laser. While Paul's doing that, this is why you don't do stuff off the cuff. <laughs> Somebody let me know what happens behind me, okay? Here's the thing, and we'll, 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 get, we'll get the image, we'll get the illustration to work maybe. Um, here's the thing. The light of the gospel is not one that just brings a little bit of light. The light of the gospel is one that hurts to look at. It's one that makes you want to go, ugh, I can't take it. But when you've experienced what the light of the gospel does, you want to be in it. Have you ever lived in a house with roaches and you walk into a dark room and turn the lights on? What happens? They scatter. Why? Because that's what sinners do. When the light of the gospel comes on, our immediate, sometimes our immediate reaction is to dart. Here we go. Here it is. This is not the light of the gospel because it's blue and the gospel's not blue. But anyway, here it is. Here's what it is. Now, I can step out of this, right? I can step away. But once you've tasted this, this is where you want to be. It hurts. It's going to show you're ugly. All the imperfections. People are going to see them. And God is saying, this is where I want you to be. I'm the light of the world. Wow, see, now it's, yeah. For your sake, I'm going to step out of the light because that just hurts. Thank you, Pastor Paul. will be a bonus in your check this week. All right, good. So, but, but, but my response was good, though, wasn't it? It was so intense, I just felt like I needed to step away from it, right? I just needed to step out. Maybe we'll want some of the, the throw of the light, just the, the, the burnout. We want just to stand a little bit, and Jesus is like, no, you want gospel, you want light of the world, you got to be in it. you got to be in the middle of it. And here's the thing, if you've never experienced that, that's where God does his best work. 
That's when you will enter into an intimacy and relationship with him like never before. That's when church becomes incredible. Because if church is being done right and well, if the gospel is being proclaimed, now that bright light is being shined, not just on us as individuals, but what? What if every one of us who had that big, bright, intense uh, light, what if every one of us as we come to church would just realize and recognize that, that God's light, that gospel is on all of us? And when we come together, that brightness intensifies. That's why it intensifies. And that's why sometimes, sometimes when the gospel is preached, sometimes people scatter. Sometimes people leave and walk away. Sometimes. That's the, that's the result. But what I love about when God brings conviction, it doesn't end there. God did not die on the cross so that you'd feel guilty about who you are. Now, God did also did not die on the cross and rise from the dead so that you'd feel good about yourself. That's not why he did that. He did those things so that you would have a relationship with him. This is where we need to talk very quickly about the committed believer. In that crowd, that morning, there were casual observers, callous critics, there were convicted sinners, and then we had this last group, these committed followers. These were the ones who, to everybody else, looked a little bit nutty. They're waving their palms. They're shouting for Jesus in this word that we need to be reminded at least once a year what it means. Hosanna is just not a word we sing because it's cool and in the Bible. Hosanna has a meaning. It means literally save now. This would be the word you would yell when you're when you're swimming in water that's too deep, you got a leg cramp, and you, you're trying to get the attention of the lifeguard. Now, here's the thing. We've turned, we've turned Hosanna into this praise and worship word, and it's not. When you're drowning, what do you say? Hosanna! Save me now. That's what that word means. Now, sometimes when we yell out that word, just like when they were yelling out that word, they wanted Jesus to save them from what they wanted to be saved from. For them, it was all about Rome, for the throne of David to be reestablished, for, for all those who were not Jews to be kicked out and sent away so they could restore themselves as a people in their land that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? So they're saying, Hosanna, save us from Rome. Save us from Pilate. Jesus came not to save them from Rome. Rome wouldn't fall till much, 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 much later in history. Much later in history. What was Jesus coming to save them from? Not Rome. Rome is nothing. Governments are nothing. Nothing compared to to the stronghold, the dominion, the dictatorship that sin has in your life and in mine. Now, maybe many in the crowd didn't understand that, but I'm committed and convinced that there were some that did. They had seen and heard Jesus teach. They were convinced that he was who he says he was. And their lives were transformed in a moment and they were committed to him fully and freely. Perfectly? No. Peter said, I'm committed. I'll go where you go. A couple hours later, nah, I didn't know him. Don't number me with them. I'm just here hanging out by the fire. Rooster. Crows in the back. Are we going to, as committed believers, are we always going to be perfect in what it means to be committed? No. But even as we talked about last week, we are intentional about being excellent in those things. Recognizing that when we stumble, when we fall in our commitment to Christ, that He calls out, He brings conviction so that we will be restored, that we will get up and move on. That is what distinguishes a Christian from someone else. Jesus brings conviction so that we will be restored. Not to put a, a boot on our necks or to pinch us in the nose and pull us somewhere, to grab us by the ear, even smack us with a switch. That's not why he does it. He does it so that we will get up. Christians always get up. 
Christians stop. When God brings conviction about a behavior, sin in their lives, they stop. They repent. They follow the word that God has provided. And they get up and they move on. And you know what? They might do that, that thing a thousand times over. Being a Christian is not about being perfect. It's about recognizing that Jesus came to save you from the very thing that sometimes we just jump into willingly. And I'll just be honest. What is the standard that God must have if you and I are going to spend an eternity in heaven with him? We must be perfect. And only Jesus can make us that. Committed believer, hear me when I say this. When God brings conviction in your life, when he identifies an area of your life where he isn't Lord, how do you respond? Is it with a depart from me? God, I'm a sinner. I, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. Is that the response? Or is it, yep, God, I know. When things are better, when things are convenient, I'll make some changes. No. Committed believers we adjust, we pivot in the moment. We repent in the moment. We change in the moment. Committed believers live a very different life. And by the way, to be a committed believer, does it mean to be perfect? No. Can you be a committed believer and still have some doubts? Oh, yeah. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. If you read Matthew 28, they were obedient to Christ they went, met Jesus on the mountain, and they, they worshipped, but it said some doubted. And even to them, those that doubted, what did Jesus say? All authority has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations. God, I don't, oh, I don't know where you're taking me, but I'll go. I don't know what you're doing, but I'll go. See, having doubts doesn't mean we stop. Having doubts means we plunge ahead, trusting in the God that has called us. There's two things I believe that characterize a committed believer. Love for Jesus, obedience to Jesus. Those two things. Oh, but pastor, what about, remember the song? Some of you who grew up in church, you sang this. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be. Some of the best theology is wrapped up in our music. And by the way, trust and obey, it's even the right order. You can't really obey Christ until you've trusted him and him alone for your eternal life. So as we close our time this morning, as we, as we remember what the kids did, what they sang and proclaimed in their, in their, in their time, here's, here's my question for you. Which one of those four are you? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Are you a casual observer? Are you just one content to watch Jesus go by as you content to, to keep yourself distant from him and from the things of God? Is that you? Maybe even just a little bit? Is that you? Could you maybe identify a point this past week where you were a casual observer? Here's the, here's the great news for you today. Today is the day for you to step out of that and into what it means to be a committed believer. There are no casual observers in Christianity. None. We can't just sit back and watch. When he calls us out of death and into life, we're called into a life. And life is defined by action and doing a new identity. If you've never received Christ and you're in that casual observer, maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're one of those callous critics. Maybe you're here this morning because someone invited you, but what we've sung, what we've said, what I've said, maybe you're squirming, I don't know. You know what squirming used to be for me? You know when I sat in church as a, as a student, as a teenager, and the pastor would be just declaring the truths of God and I'd be squirming in the pew. You know what that was? It wasn't my being uncomfortable. It was the Holy Spirit landing on me like a ton of bricks. And you know when my squirming stopped? <laughs> when I gave my life to Christ. When I stopped playing the religious game when I stopped checking boxes, when I stopped believing that coming to church made me something that I wasn't. No, it, if, 
you're squirming this morning because you've been, maybe you're hostile to the things of God. Maybe, I don't know where you are, but if you're that critic, maybe you're not a critic of Jesus. I, I'm okay with Jesus. I'm just not good with the church. <laughs> We've dealt with that the last few weeks, haven't we? You can't be good with the husband and not okay with the bride. Is the bride perfect? Nope. And even if it was, as soon as I got here, it stopped being that. So here's the reality. The standard is not the church. The standard is Christ. And I am, by, by self-proclamation, a hypocrite in transition. Say, Pastor, church is full of hypocrites. You are right. But we don't like it. We don't want to be that. We want to be more like Christ each and every day. We walk with Him. Maybe this morning you've come and say, Pastor, I'm that, I'm that convicted sinner. I feel bad. I feel, I feel guilty. Well, let's, let's talk about that for just a second. There's, there's godly sorrow and there's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians. And there is worldly sorrow that maybe cries a little bit, feels bad they got caught, recognizes I wish I did the moral thing here or there but does not yield itself to trusting in Christ fully. The Bible says in that very passage that godly sorrow leads to repentance and eternal life and worldly sorrow leads to destruction. It's not necessarily the sorrow that will determine what you are. Don't try to figure it out that way. What is God leading you to do? That will determine where your sorrow is, whether it's godly or just worldly. If you're that convicted sinner, if you know your life is completely out of step with where God wants you to be, with what his word says you need to be, then, then today is your day to go from conviction to forgiven. You were not designed to carry the burden that you're carrying if you're carrying it. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weak, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? You were never designed to carry the burden of sin that you carry. Let it go. Don't try to work it out. Don't try to clean it off. You can't. Today is your day. Palm Sunday. Jesus has ridden into your life. And he wants to save you from your sin and from his wrath. Committed believers. We have an incredible message, story to tell, do we not? We tell the story of Jesus and we tell the story of how Jesus has impacted our lives individually. There are people in your life, people in your sphere of influence who they're going to check into some Easter egg hunts. They're going to go with their kids. They're going to they're do some Eastery things, right? But they're going to come in to this season and they're going to go out of this season and it's like paying for a car wash and getting nothing. Jesus wants to do something in us. He wants to do something in you. We've been talking about unity and purity. What is this season about? Unity, purity in Christ. How are you engaging? How will you engage those in your sphere of influence, those in your life, at your workplace, the people that you hang out with who don't know Jesus or think they know Jesus? How will you engage them? Are you willing to tell them the incredible story of what Jesus did? Today is our day, Palm Sunday, where we want God to identify in our lives the casual observers, the callous critics, and maybe even the convicted sinners, that there is a place for them at the cross. Say, Pastor, do I need to invite him to church? It's a great part of the strategy. You should. Easter is a time where people say yes to coming to church. It's like one of two times every year that people, if you invite them to come to church, they might say yes. But you'll never get a yes if you don't invite them. And they will never come to Christ unless you tell them. Jesus has come. He is king. How do you answer that question for yourself? Is he king? And then what will you do in response to that truth? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, we're so grateful for the kids that came and shared this morning, God. The message they proclaimed 
was better than anything I've said this morning. God, this morning we're grateful, thankful that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem that day, declaring himself to be the King of kings, the Lord of lords. People in response cried out to him, Hosanna, save us. God, I cry that out to you right now, Hosanna. Save us. To the one in this room who doesn't know you, save them. God, to the one in this room who's faking it, save them. God, to the one who's just playing religious games, playing at church, checking in and checking out at their whim, save them. God, bring us to our knees. Cleanse us. Make us righteous. That we might be your tools, your vessels to go. To engage those in our lives who are observers, those who are critics, God, those who are burdened with sin, broken. God, that you would use us to to see new life to watch you to listen to you call them out of the grave and God I know this to be true and many of us do we will never do it if we don't believe it so God I pray for faith faith and belief that you still save faith and belief that there are still people's God, who are in this world, in this community, their names are in the book of life. God, and you just want us to go and fetch them, get them. They're your kids. God, that we would be faithful to that work. This week, God, that we would be faithful to that work. God, as we just share a time of commitment, Lord, I ask that you would, God, just move in our hearts. And Lord, Lord as you lead, we will follow. Lord Jesus, thank you for being a good and gracious king. It's in your name we pray. Let's stand together. We're going to sing just a brief song of commitment. If God's moved in you, Pastor Brad and I are going to be standing here at the front. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you about your walk with Christ. If you don't even know what that means, you're the person we want to talk to. We'd love to pray with you and talk to you what it means to know Jesus. If you've never been baptized as a Christ follower, you know you're saved, but you've never been obedient to that, maybe you would step forward today and say, Pastor, I know now's the time. I need to do that. But however God is leading you, maybe you want to come up and pray for the person, the people in your life that you need to talk to, you need to engage. They are your mission field. I'd invite you to do that. Praise team, would you lead us?